I, I couldn't I couldn't hear you on my end, and I had to change some settings, so now I can hear you perfect. All right, all right. Yeah, you're loud and clear now. Go ahead and uh, can you just, like, talk for just a couple seconds so I can make sure that the levels are right? Hello, hello, hello. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? All right, I hello, think he's hello. good, right, ladies and gentlemen? All right, I think you're good, Pine Chap. Um, are you going cameras on mode tonight? Um, let me see if I can get my Anonymous camera Anonymous sent $3. Hey, right Dalton now. Cockfeeler. It's uh, me, your long-lost cousin, good. Colton Ball. We're good. We're on. Thank Just you. Just wanted to say congrats Anonymous, on the thank you for the shows. Super Chat, buddy. He says, Keep uh, up the good work. Hey, Dalton Cockfeeler. I appreciate that. Thank you so much, Anonymous. It's your long-lost cousin, Cotton Ball Flicker. We really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Uh, Gab is in. Uh, Gab, Andrew Torba is in the chat, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, let's go. Let's go. Andrew that's Torba awesome. is in the chat. Now, I did, a, I did an interview with Andrew Torba today. It was fantastic. The guy's one of the realest people out here doing what he's doing, uh, and he's one of the only people doing what he's doing, but he's just one of the realest people, period. He's a real human being, and he says what he believes, and he says the truth, uh, and I, 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 trust me, I told him today. I was, I was all over him today, basically, just, uh, just cheesing, just cheesing hard. Uh, but it was a great interview. Catch that tonight on the right desert at 9 p.m. Eastern time. Um, oh, here we go. We got uh, we got Pine Sap here. Pine Sap, ladies and gentlemen, also with us and Nate Darnell. I already said this. Nate Darnell and Pine Sap are going head to head tonight in a salvation debate from a Catholic and a Protestant's perspective. Obviously, Pine Sap is the Catholic here tonight, and Nate Darnell is the uh, Protestant here tonight so um do you guys care who goes first do we have to like do this in a certain way no i don't mind i mean uh honestly for the audience what we could do is we could just present like what we uh what our positions are just so we're clear on definitions and stuff like that yeah that's totally fine with me uh pine tap you, you suggested it so uh you you go ahead man take the uh take the reins here yeah, so essentially the Catholic view of salvation is the idea that we are saved by faith, um, and, and we could even really say that we're saved by faith alone in a sense, um, in, in, in the sense of how a Catholic would take it, right? So that faith would include, uh, you know, uh, doing what Christ commands us, uh, receiving the sacraments and what have you. And while we believe that good works are an extension of faith, we don't believe that you are like justified by uh, good works alone. Because what that would kind of fall into is if you were justified by good works alone, that would kind of fall into the, well, I'm a good person fallacy, right? Where, you know, um, there's almost this Pelagian ideal that like, oh, if I do enough good boy points or I, I add up enough good boy points by my actions, um, I can be saved. But none of us are deserving of uh, the free grace of salvation that God gives us, right? But the way to receive this grace is through the sacraments that he's been through his church, through his proper ministers and what have you. And if we negate that out of the, um, essentially out of the uh, salvific economy, uh, in a sense, we completely neg negate the graces that he's bestowed upon us to uh uh, allow us to be in union with him and then ultimately uh, be with him in heaven forever and ever. Uh, so that's essentially a brief Catholic overview of salvation. Okay. Uh, Nate, you want to go ahead and uh, lay out lay out your positions? Yeah, I believe that uh, salvation is uh, through faith alone in Christ and that, um, you know, when Jesus died on the cross, he, one, he fulfilled the law and he paid the punishment for our sins so that through faith in him, we can be forgiven and... Um, you know, I believe that no, the, the Bible makes it very clear, which I'll, you know, explain later when we get further in, but that, you know, all righteous acts to God are as uh, filthy rags. And uh, I believe the only true righteousness that God sees in his eyes you know, through us is um, having faith in him. And having faith in Christ is the uh, only righteous thing that, um, you know, we can have. So I believe it's through faith alone that you are saved and not by uh, any works or any... Um, Nothing we can do to, you know, again, like win points to, you know, find favor in God's eyes. I believe it's uh, through faith alone. And, uh, yeah. All right. Um, I'm sure you both have uh, general opening statements as well now that we've kind of defined terms in regards to uh, salvation. Um, Pine Sap, since you, uh, since you started there, you know, I'll let you pick it up here also. Uh, sort of also give you a chance to respond to uh, Nate. 
Gotcha. So um, I, I might have difficulty recalling the scriptural verses, but let me see if I can try and utilize only the Holy Scriptures to kind of convey a Catholic view of salvation. So Jesus says that, you know, we must believe in him in order to receive eternal life, right? And me and Nate are not in disagreement of that. Likewise, I'm glad that Nate enunciated that it really is not like uh, earning your salvation or it's not like um, almost almost working it out in a sense of, again, like I do X or Y, I'm a good boy and thus I'm saved. Um, but I think where Catholics wind up disagreeing with the Protestant position is Protestants, um, at, at least um, uh, uh, sort of more uh, fundamentalist Protestants, might say, well, I only have to say I believe and that I am saved. But as even our Lord commands, there are other, th and, and even the apostles talk about by the commission of our Lord, there are other things that factor into that, right? So for instance, uh, things like, you know, receiving the Eucharist, the body and blood of Jesus Christ uh, is a part of the, the uh, journey towards that ultimate, you know, salvation that we find in heaven, right? And this is reflected when Jesus says, you know, he who does not eat in my flesh and drink my blood has no life in him. And as he says that, um, the, the uh, Pharisees actually freak out and say, well, this man wants us to eat his flesh. Like they're, they're confused by this. And Jesus doesn't respond to that by saying, oh, no, 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 guys, what I actually me meant is this was an analogy or symbol or what have you. Because even the apostles in that uh, interaction then, then thus say, well, um, we find this to be a hard teaching to believe, right? And Christ made it very clear that uh, in instituting this Eucharistic sacrifice that it happens at every Mass, that is the exact same sacrifice that he gave up for us on the cross. So again, this is maybe another uh, uh, Protestant misconception of Catholic theology is we do believe that by Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, we have been redeemed, but that sacrifice is the sacrifice that goes on at every Mass. And now when we say that um, Jesus is being sacrificed, we're not saying that um, the priest is, uh, is, is, is like taking, um, you know, almost like a spear, like St. Long, Longius and plunging it into our Lord, like that kind of sacrifice, like a Mayan temple, but rather that Christ is giving himself up freely in the Eucharist over and over and over again for the sake of our salvation. And so that is, uh, really what is going on at the mass. Um, likewise, you know, what we kind of see with the, um, Catholic view of salvation is we define in the church what it means to have faith, right? There's a very specific criteria in terms of what it means to either be a Catholic or not be a Catholic, right? It's very specific. There's not black and white. But unfortunately, it seems like in the Protestant conception of things, there's not really that that defined uh, element, right? It, it kind of seems all up to private interpretation because I might ask Nate, well, what defines a Christian? And he might give me one answer. But then if I talk to uh, Billy Joe, um, who happens to go to maybe the, I, I don't know, Seventh-day Adventist church or something like that, he might give me another answer. And the problem with this is suddenly being Christian becomes this like relative thing and people start uh, uh, defining it in different ways. Some kind of on, on, on almost a very liberal way, just saying all you need to say is you believe and nothing else matters. And some even maybe in a more rigorous way saying you need to do X, Y, Z and the other thing. So uh, that's my opening statement. All right, uh, Nate Darnell, go ahead. He took about uh, three minutes, give or take. Uh, I'll give you at least the same amount of time. Yeah, so, um, you know, as a Protestant, obviously, <clears throat> I don't believe in, you know, the uh, Eucharist being the true body of Christ um, or, you know, certain sacraments that you need, you know, baptism to be saved or, you know, anything like that. But um, I believe if you rely on, you know, doing works as a Christian, then, again, you'll never, you'll never truly be, you know, forgiven or find favor in God's eyes because again, you know, righteous acts to God are, or our righteous acts are like filthy rags. And, um, you know, when Jesus died, he, he died once and for all. So I feel like, you know, taking part in the Eucharist is, is kind of re-sacrificing Christ. And I think that's just unbiblical because again, you know, he died once and for all for our sins. And when we accept Christ, you know, we're not going to stop sinning. We're going to sin even, you know, I'm sure the day you accept Christ, you, whatever you're doing, you went home and sinned or the, the day you got baptized, you still sinned. So, you know, accepting Christ doesn't mean you're not going to sin. And 
you know, if you, and I believe that, you know, you can't just say, oh, I'm, I, I believe in Christ and then, you know, be saved, but it has to be a genuine, uh, you know, thing in your heart that you do accept him and, you know, your life will show that you accept him. You know, if you look at, um, I think it's James 2 where it talks about, you know, good deeds and having faith, you know, faith by works is dead. It's not saying you have to work for your or for salvation. It's saying, you know, if you have true faith, then your works and your fruit will prove that you uh, have accepted Christ and you have faith in him. So, you know, no, nothing we do can, you know, win favor to be saved. It's, it's truly by faith. And if you have genuine faith in Christ, again, the Bible says very clear in Galatians multiple times that righteous, that faith is the only righteous thing that humans have. Uh, according to God, because, you know, accepting his son is the one thing that he expects us to do. So, um, you know, if, if, if if you rely on your works to save you, you're just not going to have a true relationship with God. Because if you look at it from, you know, you have to do the sacraments or you have to do works, you know, to continue to be saved. I, I don't know if Catholics believe, you know, once saved, always saved, but according to you have to having to do sacraments and rituals, it kind of makes it clear that you have to always work for your salvation. And, uh, you know, Jesus already did all the work on the cross. The, the work is done. He said it is finished. You know, the, he came to fulfill the law. He died for our sins. And there's nothing left for Christ to do because he already did it. And he says, those who, you know, call upon me shall be saved. So if you rely on your man-made and your man um, understanding to for salvation, it's it's never going to happen. So that's why I believe it's it's strictly in faith alone in Christ. And, uh, again, if, 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 you know, we're we're always going to sin even after you accept Christ. So if you continue to have to do works or you have to go to confession, you have to do all these, you know, sacraments and partake in mass or, or get baptized, you know, that, that's a work. And that means you have to continue to do that. You know, I believe in once saved, always saved. So if you are saved and you have received the Holy Spirit, you know, inside of you, you have the, the, the Holy, the, the spirit of God living within you. The Bible says, you know, Christ lives within us. So, you know, obviously when you sin after being saved, you're going to feel convicted and you know, you're not, you're, you're going to feel bad of sinning. If, if you, if you're saved and you keep sinning then you, or you, if you're saved and you sin, you don't, you don't feel anything. You're probably not saved and the Holy spirit doesn't live within you. So. All right. There, there you go. Uh, uh, good job, Nate. Uh, one thing I will say before uh, Pine Chat responds, uh, we, w- we will be playing all of the Super Chats at the end of the stream, so they're not going to play during the stream. We'll also be taking a few calls. We'll limit that. These guys, you know, they're taking their time out of the day to do this. I know a lot of people have a lot of opinions, uh, but Pine Chat, you, you go ahead, man. Yeah, so um, kind of a couple different things. Again, I think there's a difference in views. So the reception of the sacraments is not a working out of one's salvation, or it, it, it's not rather me doing good works, but it's rather a requirement to having faith in Christ, right? Because how would we harmonize, um, you know, kind of the 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 more Protestant sola fide argument with, again, what our Lord himself says, where he says, if you do not receive, you know, eat of my flesh and drink of my blood— um, you know, you have no life in you. And right, and right at the last supper too, he says, this is my body, which I offer up for you. Do this in memory of me. Um, you know, this is my blood, which I will offer up for you. Do this in memory of me. Right. And do this in memory of me implies that, that, that is a, a constant Eucharistic sacrifice. Now, again, as I stated with the Eucharistic sacrifice, it isn't the priest killing our Lord. It's not, uh, the assembly, uh, in the mass, uh, wounding or killing our Lord. It's that Christ is giving himself up again um, through that sacrifice that he made the cro- uh, on the cross in the movement of the mass, right? You know, he, he gave himself up on the cross for our sake and uh, did so that we could have this Eucharistic, um, you know, body and blood of our Lord in order to have grace in us and move closer to him. Uh, likewise, uh, when we talk about being once saved, always saved, um, you know, Jesus has a lot of interesting words about that. I mean, Matthew 7, 21 says all those who say, Lord, Lord, or, you know, talks about how not all those who say, Lord, Lord, uh, will be saved on the last day and that they will be judged by their evil deeds. Right. That doesn't seem to imply that, uh, with those people that just because they simply said that they believed that they did. Now, again, um, Nate said that uh, essentially 
with the his view of salvation, it would be that those people did not have a genuine faith, but the people in that uh, essentially example that our Lord gives uh, surely think that they have a genuine faith, right? They had full, the full intention of following our Lord, and yet why didn't they? Well, it's because as our Lord commissions, if you love me, you will keep my commandments, right? Mm -hmm. Our Lord saying, if you love me, I keep you will keep my commandments makes very clear that there is a little bit more to than just saying, I believe there's there's more that has to happen there. Now, again, that is only through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit working through us. Right. That is not anything that I am I am doing or I give X amount of X amount to charity. So I have X amount of heaven points and I'm getting to heaven that way. But it's the understanding that if I have that faith, my good works will be an external sign of that good faith, right? And that's the Catholic view. Uh, likewise, you know, we kind of see uh, in regards to the once saved, always saved um, uh, kind of idea, um, you know, Acts 751 talks about, you know, stiff necked people who always resist the Holy Spirit um, and that, you know, essentially by our own free will, uh, we can, you know, resist God and his grace. Um, that, uh, you know, in first Corinthians, uh, not verses, uh, or chapter nine verses 24 to 27, Paul says that, uh, all the runners complete, but only one wins the prize. Um, and that Paul recognizes that if someone does not train themselves in perseverance, he too can become disqualified, right? Uh, meaning cut off from Christ. And in that way, it, it does mean that you could lose your salvation, right? That you could not be in, in this uh, sense of certainty of, you know, I've just said that I believe, I've just said that I have faith, and now I'm good. And, you know, in regards to confession, it's very strange that we would deny the sacrament of confession, especially since our Lord himself uh, instituted it with the apostles. Uh, John uh, chapter 20, 20 verses uh, or verse 22 says that the Lord breathed on the apostles and that gives them the, fa uh, the power to forgive and retain sins, right? That seems very uncharacteristic if our contention is that Jesus, um, you know, did not institute confession. Why would he say to the apostles that I, I breathe the Holy Spirit upon you and I give you the power to, you know, uh, loose and bind sins, right? I mean, even um, the off-quoted verse by Catholic apologists, you know, Matthew uh, 16, 18, uh, 16, 19, and stuff like that talks about a binding and loosing, right? Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in, uh, bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loose in heaven, right? Well, that binding and loosing power especially pertains to the binding and loosing of sins, right, in the sacrament of confession. And so it seems very strange that we would deny a uh, a sacrament that our Lord himself instituted, right? It wasn't any uh, Romanish invention that came along, but it was the direct commission that Jesus had to the apostles. So I'll leave it there. Yeah, yeah. I think that there's definitely a lot to unpack there. Uh, Nate, you go ahead, uh, you know, respond. I'm going to try to start breaking these down uh, now that we're kind of past those, these opening thoughts and these big key ideas, uh, these very broad strokes. I want to start getting into the meat and potatoes here, so I'm going to cut a little bit shorter uh, each time. Uh, Nate, go ahead. Yeah. Um, no, again, I agree with your stance on the, um, <clears throat> you know, the Bible says that we are known by our fruits. So, you know, if you've truly accepted Christ in your heart, then your life will show for that. And, you know, bringing it back to James 2, you know, it talks about doing good works accordance to your faith. And uh, I do agree with that. Um, but, you know, if you look at just the the... Like there's a kind of a, you said a lot, so I'm trying to like break it down. But uh, well, to okay. the uh, Take your time. to the uh, the confession thing, I, I I don't disagree that you know we can confess our sin to our brothers or to you know fellow Christians or to uh, you know when people pray for us, you ask people to pray for you or things like that. But I think the the true you know confession is is praying out to God, and um, you know He's the one who paid for your sin. So I feel like you know, all sin and all, you know, forgiveness should, or confession should be towards him. And, um, you know, I think that Catholics have a, a good or a, um, you know, they, they rely too much on the, the church for salvation. You know, they, they put their faith into the hierarchy and they, they rely too much on the, the, the church instead of relying on Jesus Christ. Because the Bible says when we pray, you know, it says to 
go into our room and pray to your father in secret. And not to say that Catholics don't do that, but I'm saying, you know, praying to God is, 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 um, what he calls to do. The Bible, you know, makes it clear that, you know, he is worth all the glory. So, uh, you know, I, I, I just think that to, for, 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 uh, freaking start, for forgiveness, it, it, it's, uh, it's from Christ and, you know, all prayer and devotion should go to Jesus. And I don't dis like, again, I don't disagree with, you know, asking someone to pray for you or, you know, repenting or, you know, discussing your life with people. But I, there's just things that the Catholic church does like the sacraments that, uh, are just, in my opinion, taken out of context, kind of how you said with the Eucharist, you know, or the last supper, how he says, this is my body and my blood. Um, I feel like that was just taken too literal because there's many, many times in the Bible where Jesus says, you know, he's the living water. The woman at the well, when he said, drink from me and, you know, you'll never thirst again. You know, she clearly thirsted again. Or when he said, I'm the branch and the disciples were the vine, uh, things like that. And now he said, you know, we're the salt of the earth and, you know, things like that. And I, I just think that the Eucharist was, or the Last Supper is symbolically showing that, the bread is Jesus's sacrifice of what he was about to do on the cross. And that was him symbolizing that that is, you know, he's offering himself up to, you know, not only the disciples, but all of humanity. So I think the last supper or the Eucharist or mass was just taken out of context and that, um, you know, the, again, the body, when he says this is my body and my blood, it was symbolizing what he was about to do on the cross. So, all right. Well, I think that's definitely a good thing that we need to be touching on a bit deeper here. That seems like a major point of contention. Um, Pine Shap, um, uh, let's definitely get more into that. The the Eucharist, uh, that that disagreement seems to be pretty hot. Yeah. So, Nate, you stated that you know you're kind of struggling with the idea of the Eucharist, and that you get you cited a lot of fantastic verses that show, um, you know, where Jesus uses. Um, I, correct me if I'm wrong, is the word allegory, like, like kind of making, or, or I guess we'd say imagery, right? Like using imagery to convey something uh, of an idea of, of, you know, his nature and his presence with us, right? Like when he says he's the living water, he's not literally saying, yeah, I'm that puddle over there, or I'm, I'm the water in that well. So most certainly the Bible is at certain junctures and points written in such a way that it does have that imagery applied to it. However, the Eucharist is very, very, very interesting because there is a different treatment of it. Um, it. It isn't so much taken in an allegorical way as it is in a serious way. Like I said, I, I cited those first verses where Jesus says, you know, or uh, those verses about, you know, Jesus saying, if you don't drink of my blood and eat my flesh, you have no life in you. And, you know, the Pharisees freaking out over that. And being like, he wants us to eat his flesh. What is he talking about? Even the apostles saying, this is a hard teaching. Likewise, even in the earliest days of Christianity, um, the nickname that the Romans had for the Christians was actually cannibals. Um, I, I can't remember the Latin term that they used, but they would call us cannibals because when any Christian was questioned, like, you know, are you eating like the flesh of our Lord? He's like, yeah, I am. But the understanding is not that, you know, of course, in, in the Catholic context, we're not eating the flesh of our Lord like some sick cannibal. It's that our Lord is giving up his flesh that he suffered, uh, that he gave up for us on cavalry in the Eucharist so that we might have life in us. Right now, go turning biblically, it's very startling how we get to first Corinthians um, and we see uh Oh my goodness, I just had it up. My goodness. Uh we we see in 1 Corinthians uh, uh uh chapter 11 verse 29 this very startling uh verse that might kind of make that idea that it was just an allegory uh a little difficult, right? We see in verses 27, therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of our Lord. Each one must examine himself before he eats uh, of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. 
And verse 30 says, that is why many young uh, among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. So what's very interesting is in that letter to the Corinthians, there is not an understanding of guys when you drink without, you, you know, when you drink of the Lord's cup, when you receive of the Lord's cup, uh, you know, we're just receiving a symbol or just remember the sacrifice of Christ. No, we see a very under, a very clear under, excuse me, a very clear understanding in that verse that there has to be an examination beforehand to understand if we are worthy to receive the cup. And in a Catholic context, that means, are you in a state of mortal sin or not? Right. And then uh, furthermore, that if we don't recognize who we are receiving in the Eucharist, the person of Jesus, that we drink judgment upon ourselves, that's a little bit more than allegorical. In fact, that, that actually implies that what we are receiving is very real, that that is the body and blood of Christ. Now, a Protestant might object and say, well, at the altar, I don't see human flesh and I don't see, you know, human blood or what have you. And, you know, putting things like Eucharistic miracles aside or what have you, um, we know from the best saints that, you know, it is not by sight that we receive the body and blood of our blessed Lord, but it is by faith in which we receive him. So even though the species, uh, I believe the species is the word of the body and blood of our Lord appears to us as bread and wine. The actual, I believe, substance, as it's called, is truly his flesh and his blood. And so that if we don't discern that when we're receiving the Eucharist, we drink that judgment upon ourselves. Would you like to respond, Nate? Yeah, no. Um, no, it's definitely good points. And uh, I've debated Sam about the Eucharist. It was like a month ago or something. And I didn't put up the best argument, I feel like. But <clears throat> I think that when, you know, Jesus said, this is my body. He was, again, he was talking about his sacrifice that he was about to, that he was about to um, do on the cross. And I believe when, you know, he, he was the Last Supper, that was just the beginning of, you know, him dying for our sins, which then, you know, faith would come in. And, um, sorry, I had a point here, I forgot. <laughs> when, uh, well, that's okay blank no but <laughs> all right all right no, no. no i had a point but it literally just left my mind <laughs> i feel like retired. do you have anything else you wanted to touch on that that he uh, uh may have said? <clears throat> well no i came back no but when uh jesus said you know when we worship him we must worship we, we must worship in the spirit and he also the bible also says that the flesh profits nothing that's not saying jesus is flesh that's saying you know our flesh so when we worship him we, we must worship in spirit and i feel like if the Eucharist being literal, then that would do something to our flesh. But it says when we worship, we must worship in spirit and that the flesh profits nothing. And again, I'm not saying that's Christ's flesh because obviously he embodied human form and died on the cross. But I believe when, when we are made new, we, we live in the spirit. And when we worship, we worship in the spirit. So that's not to say, you know, we don't live physically on earth and do good deeds and do many things but when we worship god it's it's in the spirit so i feel like the eucharist is is just another work that is uh that is in my opinion man-made and taken out of context good pine shop i think the big claim there is man-made and out of context man-made so what's very interesting is if we go to uh john uh john chapter six Verses 48 through 51. Jesus is speaking, um, you know, kind of to the apostles and, and, and to the crowd. And he is saying, uh, I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. And in verse 52 is very interesting because afterwards it says, then the Jews began to argue sharply amongst themselves. And they said, how can this man give us flesh to eat? And then Jesus, of course, responds to them in verse 53. Very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Now, 
Verse 54 comes along and he says, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I will raise them up on the last day, right? And then he says, for my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. And he says, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in them, right? So we establish that Jesus is, is not even the mana that was received in the Old Testament to uh, suffice the Israelites. It's that he is truly the bread of life. He's true. His flesh is truly the bread of life. And what's very interesting is actually the use of Greek. In the uh, verse 54 that I referenced, uh, Jesus uses a literal verb translated as trogo, which means to gnaw, chew, or crunch. Now, what's very interesting about the word trogo is that when it is used in Greek, it has a literal meaning. It quite literally only applies to eating meat. So if I was to eat bread or vegetables or fruits or any other food except meat, I would not use the word trogo in order to, uh, to essentially illustrate that concept that what I am consuming is uh, not flesh, right? Trogo is only used for eating meat. And so it's very telling that not only in John 6, uh, 54, but in 56, 57, and 58, he keeps using this word trogo, right? And it's used two other times in the New Testament, in Matthew 24, 38, and in John 13, 18. So if Jesus was telling us As we are now reconnecting. Gotcha. Um, so and we and we can give it a few. Anytime that Nate lost, he can he can fully have it back. I want him to make yeah, his point. I, I and, think I think defend. your I think your statement was uh fully fully out there. So we will pick back up where okay. um okay. We are we are back. I apologize, everybody. Uh it's it we had a little issue at the start of the stream. Not sure what's going on. It's not on my end. I've checked everything. Um, so anyway, we're gonna, we're gonna let Nate pick up where he left off. I think everyone heard a majority up until the very end of, uh, of what Pine Sap was, was saying there. So, uh, Nate, go ahead and, uh, take uh, it away. Yeah. So I just pointed out verse 58, which says this bread that came down from heaven, uh, your ancestors ate manna and died, but whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. And I think that's just same, uh, you know, it's just another point of, you know, the, the living water or the, the, the fruit of the vine, or, you know, another symbolic thing. And, you know, the Bible is also called, you know, the daily bread. And Jesus said, we must not live by bread alone, but every word that comes out of the Lord's mouth. So I think that, you know, the bread is just symbolically representing, obviously, Jesus. And Jesus, you know, is the word of God in flesh. Um, and I think it's just another parable and, like, symbolically representing that you know he is the bread of life obviously you know he said that but i don't take that in a literal sense i think when he says i am the bread of life he's saying you know we must not only we don't live by bread alone but by every word that comes out of the lord's mouth and i feel like if you know the eucharist was real and there's life in the bread and we must do that then i feel like it's it, it, it's kind of like a weird thing that you can just eat the uh the eucharist and be saved obviously I don't think anybody believes that, but I feel like in that context, it is, um, you know, if you, if you, salvation depends on eating Jesus's flesh and whoever eats the, f the flesh has life, then has everlasting life. Then I feel like you can just eat the Eucharist and you're good to go. And I feel like that's just, um, obviously I, I don't, I don't think you're saying that, but I think in the context of that, then you just have to do the works and then you can go to heaven because it says, you know, whoever eats of it, whoever eats of this bread has everlasting life. And many other things in the Bible kind of 
point to that, but I, that's why I, I think it's by faith alone and not by works, because if you rely on the Eucharist or baptism or anything, I feel like if, if you just do that, then you're saved. You know, you can just eat the bread and then you have everlasting life, because the Bible kind of says that, where it says, you know, if you eat of this bread, you'll you'll live forever. Clearly, if you eat the bread, you're not going to live forever. That's why it's a, I, I think it's, it's he's saying that in the spirit. And again, when you worship God, you must worship in spirit. And I think those words are spiritually bread, you know, spiritual bread, you know, not not flesh, not physical, you know, physical flesh. I don't think it's Jesus' physical flesh. I think it's spiritually, it's, 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 it's food spiritually. It's spirit food, and the word of God is, is uh, also spiritually, you know, is what feeds us and gives us life. And uh, that's why I think it's, it's, it's a spiritual bread, and it's spiritual food, and it's not physical. Gotcha. So um, in responding to that objection, when you cited verse uh, 58 as an example of, of kind of, again, that, that illusionary language, right, that Jesus would use, it's very interesting because um, Jesus, you know, says ate, ate mana and died. And then he, uh, and mana, of course, we know was the, uh, was actual bread that uh, our Lord, our, our, our God delivered uh, to the Israelites so that they might survive in the desert, right? But what's very interesting is whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Well, what Jesus is talking about there is the only thing not really necessarily figurative language, but a better way to put it is, again, what what he says about whoever eats of my body and drinks of my blood will have eternal life in him, right? Will have, or rather will have life in him and I will abide in him and, and he will abide in me, right? So that understanding affirms that the living forever is not Jesus saying, yeah, you, you know, you're going to have, uh, you're going to live longer than, uh, Oh, oh my god oh my goodness i'm trying to think uh one of the old testament figures right that lived for like 200 years or what have you it, he's he's not saying you're going to physically live longer than him but what he's saying is you are going to uh live forever in the sense of having and possessing eternal life right now the catholic claim is not that uh receiving a eucharist once once is tantamount to Yep, that's get into heaven free, you're instantly good and what have you. But it's an understanding that salvation is a journey, right? It's it's we are soldiers in this world, and the Eucharist is the daily bread, right? The daily bread, the bread of life that we live on in in order to receive the spiritual uh, uh food that we need to survive, right? Because if I am receiving the Eucharist and Jesus abides in me and I abide in my Lord and I'm regularly receiving the Eucharist, then that means that there's all the more time in which Jesus is in the heart of my soul and I turn away from my sinful ways, right? So it's very interesting uh, to, to see how our Lord illustrates that the Eucharist in verse 58 gives a man eternal life in the sense that he, you know, who who receives the Eucharist and uh, and of course with the other prescriptions of, you know, perseveres, right? Um and we see that in the the illustration of Jesus talking about the vineyard workers, right? When Jesus talks about how um you know, there are the vineyard workers that work all day and then there's the one that that is hired by the vineyard owner for an hour and at the end of the day they get the same pay. Well, that parable was to illustrate that it isn't about who was in 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 um, the the Catholic faith for you know X amount of time, and thus they have this amount of points. But it is rather who perseveres to the very end, who you know works to the works to the long day. And and when I say works, I don't mean you know good works. We're doing the good thing, but but rather perseveres in faith to the very end, so that he may have eternal life in Christ. And the Eucharist is that spiritual food that allows us to persist, right? Because we know that the devil is roaring like a lion from our, for our souls, right? And only through the Eucharist and through the sacrament of confession, which, um, you know, as I, as I referenced earlier, and we can go into that too, if you would like, only by receiving those sacraments and even baptism can we readily uh, be in heaven with our blessed Lord, right? It, it is only through 
having those uh, those sacraments that we can be reconciled with him. And now, Nate, you said those now those are doing extra things, but it's very interesting how Jesus seems to commission a lot of these extra things, not only in in terms of the sacraments, but also when Saint Paul implies, you know, pray without ceasing, right? Well, uh, in 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 Thessalonians or Second Thessalonians, if I'm not mistaken. Well, it would be very interesting because prayer or praying without ceasing would imply, well, that's something we're doing. That's an action, right? But what we have to understand about those actions is that they're not good works. It's rather, uh, or, or, or rather, even if they are good works, it is merely, um, is merely cooperating with our Lord. You know, our Lord has deigned these things for the sake of our salvation and and by us doing them, it's not that we are doing them in the sense that, you know, uh, like I'm physically doing this thing, but rather I'm cooperating with the grace that Christ bestows in these things, right? In prayer, in the sacraments, in these various tools uh, for our salvation that he instituted so that we may be reconciled with him. Nate, go ahead. Um, <clears throat> yeah, uh, I think that just goes back to how I, you know, to those being... Uh, you know, works in that I, I, I disagree with the baptism as well. I just disagree with anything that is beyond faith in Christ because uh, I think it was, I, I can't remember if it was Jesus that said it or, but he said, uh, you're not a one, you're not a Jew that is one inwardly, but, or outwardly, but inwardly. And he said, it's the circumcision of the heart. And, you know, to, to truly be, you know, accepted by Christ and be saved by Christ, one, it's a gift. I don't think anybody's doubting that, that salvation is a gift from Christ and not by the works of man so that no man may boast. Uh, Ephesians says that. And I feel like any works, you know, is trying to, you know, win favor in God, in God's eyes. And it, it's by faith alone that we have, we are accepted by him because um, if you look at Abraham, he was, he was one of the, you know, the greatest men in the Bible one of the greatest men, like obviously not Christ like, but he was very favored by God and he, his, his family was blessed through faith. And I can pull it up. It's in Galatians. It's about how, you know, his, his righteousness was from faith. And I believe that, you know, the only righteous act that we can do is have faith in Christ because nothing else that, you know, man can do is, is even worthy to be saved because, you know, again, Jesus did all the work on the cross. That's why he was sent down to die because if, if it resulted in us and our works, then there was no point of Christ even dying because we could have just, we could just win salvation over in ourselves. But that's why Jesus came down to die for our sins so that through him and through faith in him, we can be saved. And let me pull it up. <clears throat> But yeah, this isn't Galatians 3. It's uh, This is uh, Galatians 3. says, I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by believing what you heard? Uh, it says, are you so foolish after beginning by means of the Spirit? Are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? <clears throat> uh, so, so again, I ask you, does God give you his Spirit and works miracles among you by works of the law or by believing what you've heard? So also Abraham believed in God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And <clears throat> again, the Bible says that our righteousness are as dirty rags. But the one thing, <clears throat> you know, that God sees that is righteous is, is uh, faith in him. And I don't, I don't believe in, you know, baptism being any form of, of, you know, salvation or the Eucharist or being a part of the Catholic Church. And I believe it's strictly by faith alone. And I, 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 we all agree that we are, you know, unworthy of, you know, in God's eyes. And we're probably, none of us are righteous. But in faith, in Christ, we are made righteous. And the Holy Spirit dwells in us. And the Holy Spirit lives within us, which is, you know, gives us a, a, a righteous spirit. Our flesh is not righteous. Our flesh is still going to sin and still have, you know, sinful nature and sinful desire. But it's our spirit that's made new. And it's, you know, Bob says when we accept Christ, we get a new mind and a new heart. And I don't think it says when you accept Christ and you don't get a new mind and a new heart by doing works or by doing uh, any extra, extra step. 
because I don't believe there's any steps of of uh, salvation. I, I think it's once you realize that you're unworthy and you need a savior and there's nothing you can do besides put your faith in Christ because he's the only one qualified, then uh, I believe that's that's when faith comes in, in salvation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so um uh, now Nate, what would you what would you like me to address? Would you like me to address the works? Would you like me to address the necessity of the church? I just feel like we're getting a little little kind of spaced yeah, out. It's, I it's I'd, I'd like convoluted to here. Uh well no, I I just want to ask you personally from a Catholic standpoint, do you guys believe that faith like you can there's only salvation in the Catholic Church? Like do you believe that in order to be saved, you have to go through the Catholic church and you have to be a part of the Catholic church. Cause I ask Catholics and there's, you know, they always say, you know, they give different responses. So I want to hear, you know, your opinion on salvation. Do you have to be Catholic or is there like, is there, is there something else? That is a fantastic question, Nate. So yes, but in a qualified sense. Now let me explain. That might seem very confusing, but let me, let me illustrate that. So We believe that Christ instituted his church that might be uh, assigned to all the nations, right? Because we call the church the new Israel. There was the Israel, the Old Testament, which was, uh, you know, physically the nation state of, uh, you know, the Jews who had kept the law and what have you. But in the New Testament, and we know this from like, uh, you know, even prefigured in the book of Isaiah, that there would be a new nation made up of Jew and Gentile uh, in which they dwelled in peace and harmony together. And this was to be the new Israel. That is the church. Um, and, you know, one who is not a part of that new Israel, unfortunately, gets cut off of, of you know, uh, the, 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 the uh, olive tree of salvation, right? However, there are people, and the church understands this, there are people who have no physical access to the Catholic Church, right? They're, the, you know, people who live on islands in the middle of the, of the Pacific Ocean who would have never met a missionary, who would have never talked to a priest, who would have never known about, about Christ and his church and what have you. And it's not that those people are, are automatically saved. That would, that would be like the worst kind of universalism and would directly contradict the statement uh, of of Christ uh, issuing us to go and baptize all nations, right? But rather, it, it is the understanding that that person in that state of invincible ignorance, meaning invincible implying that they have no physical means of knowing the church, if they were to try and live an upright life in accordance with the natural law, the natural law being God's law, but but more so the law of God that is more uh, explicit in kind of our, our human understanding. So things like, you know, don't murder, don't steal from others, you know, maybe do right onto others. You know, if, if your brother is hurt, maybe help him or what have you. Um, if that person did, did that, um, and Jesus knowing their heart would know that if they did interact with the church, that they would readily convert to her and readily become a Catholic. Well, that is a baptism of desire, right? That is a bapti- That is a uh, a desire to be a part of his church. And knowing that Christ could bestow his mercy upon that person and bring them out of that situation and essentially uh, make them a informal member of the Catholic Church. But for the larger whole of humanity, we do believe that uh, you do have to be a Catholic in order to be saved. And the reason why is because Christ would not institute his church uh, if he did not desire all men to be reconciled with it. Uh, You know, what with the, you know, horrid state of this world and all the lies and dissensions we hear, you know, Christ wanted this this rock on which his flock could rest. And that is the church. So does that answer your question? Uh, Yeah, I mean, I I just. uh, It just leads me to having like a question about your opinion on, because clearly I'm not a Catholic and I'm sure a lot of people watching this aren't and many people around the world aren't Catholic, but you know, I just want to know your opinion. Like personally, I, I've, I've seen God move in my life. I've seen God bless me with things and I've, I've, you know, I've seek Jesus and I believe personally, I believe that I'm saved. You know, I've seen the things Christ has done for me. I've seen him answer my prayers. I've, I've, I've felt the presence and I've felt the Holy Spirit and you know many non-Catholics have too. So it just uh, what do you, what's your opinion on that? Do you think we're unsaved because we're not Catholic, or 
you know, what do you, what do you think? Well, I can say a couple of things. I, I would say that, um, all, um, because we believe what makes, uh, someone, uh, uh, essentially. So, uh, to clarify a teaching in the Catholic church, uh, we believe that many Protestants have valid baptisms, right? Because the formula for baptism is I baptize you in the name of the father and the son and the Holy spirit. So, I was baptized in the, into the Episcopal Church of America, meaning I had a valid baptism. It was done licitly uh, and, and what have you. And so when I came into the Catholic Church, I did not have to be rebaptized because I, I already had my baptism. So in that way, uh, Protestants are uh, a Christian in the sense that they're Christian by their baptism, right? But there is an understanding that um, God can use great graces in a Protestant's life, right? Um, and, and Vatican II talks about this. Uh, you know, God can can use uh, the bits of truth that are in Protestantism or Eastern Orthodoxy or what have you uh, to to kind of draw in men closer, but closer to the fullness of truth, which is only found in the Catholic Church. And so this is why all Catholics are commissioned with wanting to uh, convert or reconcile our separated brethren to the church, because we know that the church is the ark of salvation outside of which there, there is none, right? Um, and so with the most ardent desire, we, we wish to engage in evangelization, uh, uh, you know, ecumenism and what have you in order to bring those, uh, those uh, lost sheep back into the flock that they may be our brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus. But um, we understand that in these, um, uh, these, these either apostolic churches like the Eastern Orthodox churches in the sense that they have apostolic succession or in uh, the ecclesial communities of uh, Protestantism, that um, there are many uh, signs that God uses to point to that ultimate truth. This is why you have fantastic writers like C.S. Lewis, who who wasn't Catholic, but I mean, many Catholics, myself included, read him and love his works. This is why you have um, guy, uh, like a book I'm reading right now is Way of the Pilgrim, and that's technically a, a, a Russian Orthodox book, but it's fully Catholic in its theology and what have you, and there's a lot of spiritual fruit to be had. But ultimately, those materials point back to the truth of Catholicism and thus reconcile us to the fullness of truth. Does that make sense, or did I did I get a little wordy there? No, I, no, you're pretty clear. I mean, obviously, I disagree. I think that, you know, all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And, you know, I don't, obviously, there's division in Christianity. We all We all can see it. And, you know, I, I obviously disagree with progressive Christianity and I, I, I classify myself as non-denom and, you know, obviously there's a lot of problems in there too, but I don't really see that you have to be a part of a certain church or a certain denomination in order to be saved. I, I, I believe it's, it's truly spiritually, you know, in your spirit and in your heart, having faith in, in, in Christ. And I feel like it doesn't matter what you're a part of or because you know we're 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 humans we're imperfect we 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 may all interpret the bible differently you know there might be uh you know christians that have you know they 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 clearly believe jesus christ is god they believe he died for our sins and that he's the only way to heaven but they may disagree with you know if the rapture's real or if uh something you know just a, a theology misconception or anything like that and i don't think that having that opinion is, is not qualified for it, qualified for salvation. So I, I think that no matter what church you're a part of, it's really the works of the Holy spirit that can, is the only thing that can save us. And, you know, again, having faith in Christ and Christ alone is truly the only thing that can save you. And I don't believe it's by any church. You know, I, I don't think there's salvation in any church. I, I think there's salvation in the name of Jesus only. And, you know, all who call upon his name, and truly accept him in their hearts shall be saved. So I don't think it's by any church, it's by any denomination, it's by any teaching. I mean, obviously, if you if you're a oneness versus Trinitarian, you know, maybe you're unsaved because you just believe in a false Jesus. But you know, if if it's some simple theology or it's a different church, I don't believe that's make or break your salvation. I, I feel like salvation is is strictly in the name of Christ, and. He is the one who who saves. He's the one who 
you know, God has given us Jesus Christ as a gift, and through his grace, if we put our faith in Christ, we can be saved. And, you know, I, I think the Bible makes it very clear that there's, you know, no salvation in any, any other name. There's no, there's no other way to heaven. Jesus Christ is the way, the life, and the truth, and no one comes to the Father except through him. And obviously, again, there's churches that teach wrong. There's churches that are just completely wrong. But if truly in your heart you seek Christ and you have that faith that he is the one true way, I, I think that's, that's, that's all you need is, is salvation. I mean, it's faith in him alone. Yeah. So, you know, there's a, there's a, excuse me, sorry. I keep, I had lunch before this. So I keep moving, <laughs> that's fine, but, that's fine. Uh, Go ahead. Um, so there, that's very interesting, Nate, because, you know, why would our Lord in, uh, Matt in, in the book of Matt or in the gospel of Matthew, rather in chapter 18, our Lord talks about, do you remember the, the, um, not parable, but, but what our Lord commissions to do with an erring brother? Uh, do, you, do you remember our, our Lord talking about that? I can't recall off the top of my head, but Th that's totally fine. I, and, and this is not some gotcha, like how much scripture can you remember? Cause I would be, I would be the worst at that. You know, I, I, I don't want to, I don't ever want to do something like that, but What's very interesting is our Lord talks about what to do with an erring brother, right? So a brother who is in error. And so our Lord starts off and he says, um, and I'm using right here, kind of a more contemporary uh, translation, the new living one. Um, if another believer sins against you, go privately and point out the offense. If the other person listens, uh, listens and confesses it, you have won that person back. So you've gained a brother, right? Then it says in verse 16, but if you are unsuccessful, take one or two others with you and go back again so that uh, everything you say may be confirmed by two or three witnesses. Okay, so that's this, the second criteria after we've, we've exhausted the first of you going to them in private, right? And then the third criteria and the final criteria that our Lord himself, not even one of the apostles, but our Lord himself establishes in Matthew 18, 17, as he says, if the person still refuses to listen, take your case to the church. Then if he or she won't accept the church's decision, treat that person as a pagan and as a, and, or a corrupt tax collector. Sorry, this is a different translation, but right there, take it to the church. Now, what's very interesting is what does our Lord imply there? Our Lord implies a couple things. That if the church comes down on a decision and, and, and the decision is negative for the erring brother, that, that that erring brother is as a tax collector and a Gentile onto the other Christians, right? It's very interesting. It, it's not our, 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 our Lord... Um, you know, saying, oh, you know, uh, just the two or three of you or what have you, but but this unified body of this church, this one unified body of the church, declaring a decision that would see someone outside of the fold of the church, right? And thus outside of the fold of the Lord, as implied in the, uh, the commission there, right? Likewise, there is an understanding that the church's judgment is acting on behalf of our lords that when it is the church that speaks it isn't the church that speaks on its own accord but with the voice of the lord and this is reflected in verse 19 or uh, sorry rather 18 and he says i tell you the truth whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven and whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven now something very interesting there if our Lord said that that church would have a certain judgment that would be his judgment, and we know that our, our Lord's judgment is, of course, infallible, right? That, that, our, that our Lord's judgment would contain no error, it wouldn't be wrong. That would have to imply that that church had a certain infallible judgment, too. Well, what church claims all of the earth to have infallible judgment? Every Protestant church I see contradicts itself. I was Anglican. 
And the Anglicans in the 1930s during the Lambeth Conference overturned a perennial teaching that uh, contraception, uh, the use of contraception, which uh, biblically is known as the sin of Onan, right? That Onan spit, uh, in Genesis spilled his seed on the ground instead of impregnating his wife, as, as the commission of our Lord said, right? They physically overturned that perennial teaching, that apostolic teaching that came from the apostles themselves to then say, well, now you can use contraception. Now that's okay. That's not an infallible judgment. And so thus, I was ruled out as saying that the Anglican church was true. How about many of the other Protestant churches that seem to contradict one another or seem to uh, split into dissensions or fights amongst them? How about the Eastern Orthodox who, you know, can't seem to uh, agree on a consensus and there's the, you know, Gre Greece and Alexandria's and schism with Russia and Russia won't recognize uh, the Estonian patriarchs autocephaly or what have you. Um, there's only one church in which we are one body and we say that it has infallible judgment and that's the Catholic church. And many who have converted to Catholicism remarked something very telling that the Catholic church seemed to be the same all throughout the ages, that despite other groups coming along, claiming to speak for the Lord, it was seemingly only the Catholic church that ever had a solid foothold and a solid grounding on that that commission of the apostles and thus have the judgment that our lord refers to in matthew 18 17. so i said a lot there please respond uh, i would like to say um just for the chat could you reiterate a few uh points there um we crashed again it seems to be happening like every 30 minutes um, oh my goodness gracious yeah, yeah, just like just like cliff notes and then nate can go yeah. into his broader if you don't mind that's that's totally Sorry fine. This is one chart. of my favorite points to make in, okay. in talking with people and evangelizing. So Matthew 18, 17, the church uh, ruling a judgment on an erring brother and thus because the judgment might be negative, that erring brother would become a heathen and a tax collector onto the church and thus onto Christ, right? And Christ in Matthew 18, 18 says, I tell you the truth, whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven. Whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. Only a church with infallible judgment could do that. Only a church that we know we could turn to because as, as our Lord is saying in those verses, when the church speaks it is he who is speaking, right? He, he, when the church is declaring this judgment, it is Christ declaring this judgment through his church, right? Only a church that we know we could trust and turn to and, and have complete faith in to deliver the untainted gospel of the Lord could be that church. And so thus I made the point that every other church that claims to be true contradicts itself, splits into dissensions, is not one as our Lord prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, and only the Catholic Church united with blessed Peter and the bishops in communion with him, is that one church. So that was my cliff notes of my whole point. There you go. Uh, Nate, go ahead. Sorry, once again, sorry about that, guys. I, it's not on my end. I've looked at it. Also, shout out Spexo is in the chat. All the yellow names in the chat. Harris Walker, I've seen. Wooza, I've seen. Kai, I saw for a second. Shout out to you guys. Thanks for hanging out. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm sorry, guys. Not on my end. I don't know what's going on. But uh, But go ahead, Nate. Yeah, no, this, um, you definitely laid out some good points, especially before the video crash, probably. But um, I guess I just disagree with the foundations of, you know, the church, because um, I believe I, I do believe that, you know, there is a church, a, a true church, but I believe it's a spiritual church, kind of how like obviously the Jews aren't the chosen people anymore. And, you know, the new Israel is um, <clears throat> a spiritual nation of Christians uh, and the Bible makes it very clear that, you know, you can be citizenship with Israel if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ <clears throat> and, you know, Abraham's seed is the promise and all who, all who have faith in Christ are Abraham's seed and Abraham, and Abraham was who the promise was to. And, you know, it just goes back to the church history, I guess, because I disagree that, you know, Peter is the first Pope because the Bible says that the pillars of the church are, are Peter, James, and John, 
and that Christ is the cornerstone. And, you know, I just disagree with the the foundations of the Catholic Church. So I believe, you know, that there is room for corruption. There is room for false teachings. So I believe if, you know, you're there's an error and you bring it to the church, that doesn't mean the church is always right because it's still, you know, it's still, it's still ran by humans. You know, that, that's, that's like saying the Catholic church is perfect, which I just hundred percent disagree, uh, obviously disagree with, but I feel like most Catholics believe that their church is perfect and that there's no corruption in it and there's no contradictions over the years and, you know, things that change and stuff. So obviously I, I believe that, you know, if there is an error, you know, Jesus said, bring it to the church or talk in secret and then bring it to the church. But again, I, I, there's, there's just undoubting, you know, there's, there's just verses in the Bible that you just can't deny that, you know, it's, it's salvation is through Christ alone. And there's hundreds of verses that point to it, <clears throat> you know, as simple as John three sixteen, where it says, you know, God sent his one and only son and whoever believes in him and in him shall have everlasting life. You know, it's, it's simple verses like that, that just prove that it's, it's, it's through Christ alone and that there's no other name under heaven that we shall call upon. And, um, <clears throat> you know, it's just there, you just, I, I'm sure Christ knew, obviously he's an all knowing God that there would be schism and there would be contradictions in Christianity. So that's why I just disagree with there being a one true church, um, and if you look at Vatican II, I mean, there's just a lot of things that just don't add up. And, you know, Vatican II is when, I guess you could say, modernism entered the Catholic Church and a lot changed. So it's just over the years, you know, there's been a lot of changes and a lot of corruption. And, you know, God knew this would happen. God, obviously, he's all-powerful and he's all-knowing. So he would know that Christians would argue. He knew that Christians would disagree and contradict. So that's why I believe it's through faith alone in Christ. And you don't need a church to be saved. You don't need... Uh, you know, any sacrament, it's through faith alone. And if you call upon Christ and truly in your heart, and again, it's the circumcision of the heart and it's in the spirit, the Holy Spirit dwells within you, then you shall be saved. And, you know, again, it's just the foundations of the church. And, you know, I'm not doubting that there is a church, but I believe the church is a spiritual nation where it says, once we accept Christ, we have communion with God. We have communion with Christ. And once we accept Christ, the Holy Spirit dwells within us. And the Bible also says that the Holy Spirit does not dwell within things that were ma made by, you know, human hands. You know, we are temples of God. And if we are temples of God and we have the Holy Spirit, then that means Christians are the church. And that doesn't mean there's one true church. Because again, you know, there's contradictions in, I believe, all churches. I'm not saying my denomination is correct or all Protestants are correct, but I definitely don't agree that, you know, all Catholics are correct either. And again, we're man, we're men, we're, we're humankind, and there's going to be corruption, there's going to be error in, in every aspect of our lives, you know, and that's why it's, it's through faith, because faith in Christ can't really be corrupted. There's nothing that can be corrupted. If you truly put your faith in Christ being the one and only way to heaven, then that can't be corrupted because it's just, it is what it, it is, you know, exactly what it is. So... All right, Pinesup, I think uh, I saw you emote a little bit there on the Vatican II, so I'm sure we'll get into that. Uh, the moment he mentioned Vatican II, <laughs> I I don't care who's listening to this. I do defend Vatican II, and I, and I, I, I live and die by the Second Vatican Council as I live and die by all councils of the Catholic Church. Um, I've, I've come under flack from a lot of other Catholics because of it um, and a lot of other people, and I don't care. Hey, he's um, a trad because... Protestant, you know? Yeah, I, and, <laughs> ultra and trad. That's a, yeah, he's ultra trad, right? Um, <laughs> and and if Nate would like me to speak uh, specifically to any problems that he sees with Vatican II contradicting tradition or something, I, like anyone who follows the narrow way can can tell you I I pretty much have covered any issues that people see. But um, pertaining to maybe sort of the biblical things first, you know, it's very interesting because with that spiritual church well we understand as catholics that there is the church triumphant right so the church triumphant is is spiritual in the sense that it's it's literally the church in heaven right so like that's where you know the saints are and the saints are you know whoever is in heaven right whoever has uh, been reconciled with our blessed lord and the bond and unity of heaven forever and ever and we also know that um 
there has to be, in order for us to get to heaven, there has to be an external sign of that heavenly church on earth, and we call that the church militant. And it's very interesting because in the Bible, we see physical churches, and we see physical churches that are being written to uh, by the apostles and stuff like that to correct any errors so that, again, they may be one in faith. Now, it doesn't make any sense or it doesn't logically follow that Christ would make this physical church or this visible church, and then we would have it split off into a million different factions and sections and what have you, and not know what what church uh, to turn to, to listen to our judgment, as we heard in Matthew uh, 18, 17. Now, again, I think that there's a misunderstanding of it's the church versus Jesus, right? It's 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 salvation through Jesus or salvation through the church. But the the way that Catholics see it, it that's a false dichotomy. You know, uh, uh, this th this is not a, a biblical argument, but I'm willing to turn to one. Saint Cyprian of Carthage once said, "He who does not have the church as his mother cannot have God as his father." Right, and this makes sense because uh, we see. That um, in, for instance, John 17, 21, that Jesus states that the visible unity of the church would be a sign that he was sent by God, right? And that's a very important verse because that unity bears witness to his divinity. The fact that he could bring together Jew and Gentile, you know, these, these warring factions. I mean, St. Justin Martyr um, in his time said, you know, the nations used to hate each other. We used to kill each other, but now we live in peace because... Thanks be to God, we're a part of the, the universal Catholic Church, right? Um, and, and we see that exactly uh, accomplished, not only prefigured in the book of Isaiah, right? But but in that verse, John 7, uh, 17, 21. And, you know, it's very interesting that Paul says in, for instance, Romans 15, 5, that Christians must live in harmony or uh, with one another, and that um, he warns in Romans 16, 17 to avoid those who create dissensions and difficulties. Well, if we were to avoid those who created dissensions and difficulties, I might ask dissensions from what? Because dissensions implies that it is a it is a cleaving off of something we could visibly see, right? Like if I cut off, if if I cut off fabric from clothing, right? I'm physically cutting off strips of fabric for, from the larger piece of clothing, right? And in a similar way, people who create dissensions, right, and create division are creating division from something that is whole and something that is visibly whole as well. And this visibility can be reflected in our Lord's words in uh, Matthew 5.14. And when he said, he says, um, you know, a city set on a hill cannot be hidden, and that it, this is a reference to the church, right? And that exactly, you know, as we talked about the Eucharist before, that this Eucharistic communion that we share in the body of the church is that external sign of the city on the hill. I mean, it's very interesting how, you know, every group will kind of just say, oh, oh, I'm Christian, but that could have a, a, a million different ways. And and when I say this, Catholic Catholics are Christian. That's a synonymous term. But people pick out Catholics specifically as being kind of set apart, right? And in that way, we're we're kind of that city on the hill, that there's there's this unity of I can go to a Ciro Malabar Catholic church, and Ciro Malabar is just a right of the Catholic church, right? Or I can go to a Latin Rite Catholic Church or an Eastern Rite Catholic Church. And those people are as much my brothers in Christ's one body uh, as if they went to my exact same parish, right? Um, we're, we're all one in that, in that body. And it's a visible sign that Jesus instituted in which all men could be reconciled with him. And we also know that, that the church speaks on behalf of Jesus because as Ephesians 5.30 says, or 525, excuse me, that the church is the bride of Christ, right? Implying not only oneness, but if you have a bride, right, that bride wouldn't be dissenting from you. That bride wouldn't be acting in, 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 in a contrary nature to you. And so we, we see this understanding, even in our Lord's prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, 
that, you know, Father, I pray that they may all be one, right? That they may all be one in faith. Well, we can really only be one in faith if we have the same faith, if we have the same, essentially on, on the specific dogmatics, the same view and what have you. If we don't have the same view, how would an atheist look at that and say, well, that's the truth? Because if, if we say, believe in the truth of Jesus Christ, and then they're like, well, what is this truth I'm accepting? And we say, well, I don't really know because Billy Joe is going to tell you one thing and Billy Jean is going to tell you another. That to someone who does not believe would come off as, yeah, you're just not, you're selling me snake oil. You're just selling me another ideology. But we can see that only in the Catholic Church, this this continuity of belief and, and what have you is preserved. And uh, in our in my next statement, if you'd like me to address any uh, uh, supposed problems with Vatican II or what have you, I'd be perfectly uh, willing to do that. But go right ahead, Nate. I'm sorry, I went for a long time. No, no, it's um, yeah. Again, I guess I guess it's just I disagree with the definition of the Church between Catholics and Protestants because uh, again, I, I believe that the Church is a spiritual nation full of of Christians, and you know, just the Catholic Church. It, there's just things in the the things they teach that are just weird to me and the things that you know push me away from you know thinking that Catholics are the true church um I mean Vatican too you said you you agree with it but you know the people pe- Catholics always say that the Catholic Church you know can't be corrupted or that it's it's the true church of Christ but it's like Vatican II is the is the one that basically again it it brought in modernism and it it, it changed a lot of things and I, I get you know the times change, and I think I, I think it's Cath, uh, Vatican II where they no longer made the death penalty, you know, a uh, Catholic thing. But you know, I, I get it's you can't really go against the Italian government with the the uh, the death penalty. But again, it kind of that's kind of the point, though. It's like if if the Church is the true Church of Christ, then how do they not have more authority on the earth? You know, why is the Catholic Church not, you know, stopping? The, the globalists, why why is the Pope meeting with um, the World Economic Forum and why is, it, it, I just don't understand. If, if, the, if that was the true church, then why, you know, did the Pope support the vaccine? Or why did the Pope, you know, again, he meets with the Rothschilds, he meets with the World Economic Forum. And it's, it's things like that that just kind of push people away, I think, because if it was the true church of Christ, then why is there not more influence? Why is there not more power behind it why is is the catholic church not you know taking over corrupt governments why is it not stopping you know very wicked people from controlling the planet and i'm not saying any person can i mean that's obviously why jesus is coming back to destroy those people but you know the italian government rome there's some evil people there or just in general with you know these these satanic organizations like the the bankers the rothschilds the the uh world economic forum and you know the the who the world uh, world health organization and all these you know organizations i feel like if if it was the true church of christ and they had that much power and they're truly you know god's church then why isn't there more authority in the church and another thing is i just don't get why people are you know they fear they fear rome and they fear the pope and many christians i mean many catholics that i've talked to they say you know you can't speak out against the the pope you can't you can't um, speak up against it. You can't do any of that. And I just I just disagree because there's no biblical evidence to show, you know, that type of authority that the Pope has or that we should fear man or that we can't speak out. Because, uh, you know, to say the Catholic Church is perfect and, and there's no corruption is kind of just, just doesn't make sense because there, there, there is a lot in my opinion. Um, and, you know, the, the Bible says, or Jesus said not to call any other man you know, religious man on earth father, but then the Catholic church calls the priest father. So, you know, it's, it's things like that, that just kind of just doesn't make sense. I just want to say really quick, uh, chat lost its mind when Nate was talking about the Rothschilds and stuff. <laughs> I just saw chat went crazy for like five seconds there. Uh, go ahead. Pines up. You got it. So there, there's a lot to unpack there, but let's see if we can go through it. So Vatican II, when everyone always talks about modernism, modernism, modernism is this big, spooky word. It's like, you know, ooh, the phantom of modernism. But 
they never really show what they're actually talking about. Now, something important to keep in mind, when Vatican II occurred, what era was that? That was the 60s, right? And that was the height of the sexual revolution and the cultural revolution. And we know that because the church operates in the world, whatever happens in the world, you know, affects the life of the church in some way. Now, in the sense of not corrupting her teaching, but in, in the sense of the elements that can be uh, 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 corruptible at certain uh, points of time. And, you know, I, I think what sometimes, unfortunately, Catholics might accidentally do when we're talking with uh, Protestants or, or, or anyone else is when we say that the church is perfect, we need to be careful about what we're saying is, is preserved from error and what is not. Men in the church, like such as uh, bishops or what have you, can make uh, personal mistakes. They can be, you know, corrupt and awful men and stuff like that. And many saints had to go in and and clean it up. I mean, um, Saint uh, Leo the Ninth and Saint Peter Damian single handedly had to essentially clean out a lot of corruption that had uh, accumulated over almost a 200 year period amongst the clergy and stuff like that. And uh, the book of Gomorrah written by uh, St. Peter Damien talks about a lot of the uh, uh, sexual promiscuity of a lot of clergy in his day. Right. And, and the sins that they were committing awful sins, right. Sins that we would think like, you know, are only found in the 21st century, but he writes this book talking about the penance and, 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 and the sort of reform needing to be done. However, that is not what is uh, incorruptible about the church. We know that men err. We know that men make mistakes. We know that men can sin. And even the Pope himself can sin too, right? Um, the Pope, you know, something people misunderstand about papal infallibility is it is the Pope in his official capacity as Peter uh, binding loosing uh, an issue of faith and morals on the church. But even with that, he takes the entire corpus of scripture, tradition, and the whole uh, consensus of the larger body of bishops and of the church in order to bound something to the church. So we don't believe that the Pope is a magical oracle that carries around with him just every ready answer in his head or that... Um, or that he is uh, he is the author of Revelation, right? He's only its interpreter, right? A a along with his brother bishops, and we understand that when the bishops uh, and and the Pope are gathered together in a solemnly convoked ecumenical council or make a a a, a, a binding decision a decision on the Church, they are preserved from error. Now, likewise, there are certain things that are subject to change in the Catholic Church, and this is what we call. Uh, extraordinary magisterium versus ordinary magisterium ordinary magisterium covers those things which are applicable to our times right so for instance there uh could be a time in the medieval ages where there was this certain i don't know, crime people were committing or something like that right and the pope will issue the pope uh, alongside the bishops will issue maybe a papal bull to the universal church saying hey we're gonna you know um, uh, offer, you know, penance for the specific weird, weird crime that seemed to only happen in that time. Right. And then someone could come along years later and say, well, you know, you guys didn't change that. Well, that was not meant to be a forever binding statement. That was, that was, you know, uh, plumber work for a specific, um, uh, specific patch that just need to be filled in a specific time. Right. Um, this is the same sometimes with certain Catholic social teaching things, right. You know, our, our political situation changes. And so the church in her principles does not change, but in how she goes about uh, pursuing those principles in a certain political situation might change. You know, we went from a world of monarchs to a world of democracies. And so the church had to figure out a way to best navigate that. And, you know, kind of getting to the, uh, uh, to what you said about uh, the Holy Father, Pope Francis, you know, Pope Francis is in a very difficult position because uh, I think the number of Catholics around the world is, I want to say 1 billion or 1.3 billion. That's 1 billion souls under his care. And he has to be very careful about the decisions that he makes because if he suddenly just blows up or does something, you know, I, out of the ordinary or, or says, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to just do this thing and go ahead with it. Um, those can be Catholics that are killed. 
Those can be Catholics that are persecuted. Those can be churches that are shut down, made illegal, uh, made illicit, what, what have you. And even in that, um, in these meetings, the Pope hasn't capitulated at all to the demands of the modern world. I mean, the modern world demands changing morality, and the Pope has condemned uh, the German bishops for the goofiness that they've got going on. Um, you know, Pope St. Paul VI, for instance, um, the whole world, every other church had embraced uh, contraception, but he, uh, even against other bishops in the church, had the gall to restate the perennial teaching about uh, contraception is not allowed in Humanae Vitae, a document that Pope Francis has even up upheld to this day, right? And so in Pope Francis's dealings with those people, you know, the, the Pope is, in some sense, because of his role, a political leader like many. And so he kind of has to play ball. Because I see the same people that criticize the Holy Father for, for such actions, but then they'll likely excuse Trump for for a meeting with, like, Angela Merkel, right? Well, Merkel's an awful woman. She did horrible things and supported awful things and can really be credited for much of the decline that we see in Germany, right? But we understood that, like, uh, Donald Trump in, in meeting with uh, a Angela Merkel was trying to play ball in order to affect a certain political situation. And Pope Francis in that capacity is much the same way. I have no doubt that if there was a very uh, real persecution of, of, you know, like guns and tanks coming up coming around and, and, and the, and, you know, people being like, you know, Holy father, you need to, you need to do X or Y right now and stuff like that. I think him and his brother bishops would say, no, you need to mar martyr us just like what happened in the early church, right? St. Peter was killed at Rome. St. Paul was killed at Rome. Um, you know, all the, all the early apostles were martyred. Um, the history of like the first, I, I think like two to 300 years of the popes, Every almost every successive one was killed in some way by the Roman authorities. So there was a lot of martyrdom dumb that occurred. And Pope Francis has even taken positions that are not popular. You know, everyone wanted him to just say, you know, Russia was the cause of, of the Ukraine war and stuff like that. And, and you need to take this definitive stance, go with the rest of the world. And he said, well, you know, he said, I, I don't deny that maybe Russia did some bad things or what have you. But he's like. I understand Ukraine did a lot of bad things as well. And he's like, war is an awful thing. And he got a ton of flack for that, right? So what we have to understand is when we see the Pope operating or, or even some bishops, there has to be a level of, you know, they're tending to their flock. And because they're tending to their flock, there's some difficult decisions that need to be made. Even in the early church, for instance, like Tertullian writes, like Christians would pray for the emperor. The emperor that was persecuting them, the emperor that was killing them, right? They would pray for the emperor and, and they would say, in all things that belong to you, we are readily obedient. But into the things that belong to God, we do not obey. And I think Pope Francis and all our holy fathers and the, and the world stage of bishops follows much of the same course. Um, so I, I'll, I'll leave it off there. If you have a specific question about Pope Francis or Vatican II or something like that, I'd be more than happy to answer. That's pro uh, really quick before he... He does. He hates this conversation. He hates when people, I think we're about to be back. I am 95% sure because it just did the same thing. Um, Satan hates these conversations, back. man. We're back. back. We're back, I think. Sorry about that, everybody. I don't know what's going on. I don't think it has anything to do with me. So, but I'll, I'll take a look at it at the end of the stream. Uh, and make sure of that. Um, anyway, so we left off. Nate Darnell, he is going to give his uh, rebuttal to that. And then they're both going to give closing statements. Then we'll get into Super Chats. And then potentially, uh, Voice Changer. Are people... Well, now, what? Dalton, you're high-pitched. What is going on there? <laughs> okay. Definitely Satan. What is going on, man? Definitely. 
For me, the stream is still down. For you, the stream is still down? Yeah, it just might be my phone, though. Yeah, well, you have third world Wi-Fi. All right, we're back. Is my voice actually retarded? Can someone check that, please? I have, like, all, I have three people sitting here on a couch across from me, and nobody is, like, trying to, like, check the audio. Fine. Oh, okay. I hear you sound, you sound good. good. On my end, you sound great. That's what I was thinking. Okay, all right, then let's get into it. Damn, dude. It's like everybody's fucking useless around here. <laughs> Shit. Also, by the way, before we get into this next one from, from Nate, Sam, how about you wake up, dude? Open up your eyes. Stop looking like that, you creep. <laughs> it's because he doesn't have his Andrew Tate playlist. No, yeah. no, no. It's because I have no bubbly. Shut up. Nate Darnell, you're up, man. <laughs> and go ahead, big guy. Um, yeah, so to respond to the, uh, just the Pope. <laughs> what? <laughs> nothing, nothing, nothing. Go ahead, Nate. Sorry. Uh, yeah, I just, uh, I don't. I don't see how anywhere in scripture does it point to, um, well, clearly again, I, I disagree that Peter was the first Pope, but just beyond that, I don't see it, it telling us to take any authority from anybody except Christ. And I guess from your argument, it could be, you know, church, the church is, you know, Christ's voice. So it would be taking authority from that. But again, I just, you know, the, the Pope said that the vac getting the vaccine was a moral obligation. And I feel like if he truly was a shepherd, and it was his job to, um, uh, you know, you know, lead people not into damnation or to, you know, suffering or to pain. I mean, we can all, from a, a spiritual aspect, agree that the, the, the vaccine was uh, was planned. It was a bioweapon. It was it was poisonous. And I feel like for him to say it's a moral obligation is is a very concerning thing. And it just kind of points that he's kind of uh, uh, along with the agenda. And I just disagree how anywhere in the Bible does it say take authority from, you know, a man or a high, anybody in a high position. And, you know, I, I agree church discipline. I agree obeying your, your church and obeying you know, the teachings of Christ. But I just don't agree with, you know, the Pope being, you know, again, how, how your Catholics call him the Holy Father. I believe the only Holy Father is, is um, you know, the Father in heaven and the only Holy being is God, you know, it being Jesus, the Holy Spirit and the Father. That's the only holy, uh, the holy, you know, body. So I feel like calling the Pope, the Holy Father is, is uh, in a form blasphemy. And I have this, uh, this is a saint that said this. It was uh, St. Catherine it says, even if the Pope were Satan incarnate, we all not to raise up our head against him, but calmly lie to rest on his bosom. And just, you know, something like that just kind of points to how people obey the church too much. They, 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 uh, they're, they're afraid of Rome. You know, they're afraid of the Pope. They're afraid to speak out. And, you know, all throughout history, you know, the Catholic church would, it would, you know, cut people's tongues out for, for, uh, speaking against the church or teachings of the church. And I just feel like people, people are too connected and, and they cling too much to it, to the church instead of Jesus Christ and, you know, God, the father. And, um, again, going back to the church, you know, we don't need, we don't sound, you don't find salvation in a church. You, you, we have the Holy spirit that lives and dwells within us, which the Bible says is, is the comforter. It's, it's, it's our knowledge. It's, it's everything. And that's why I believe that, you know, salvation and, and, and knowledge and purpose and, and comfort is found in the Holy spirit because, you know, Jesus went to heaven and gave us the Holy spirit that lives within us. And I believe that that is what, you know, is in us that tells us what's good or what's wrong. Or, you know, when we say something unbiblical, it convicts us. Or when we sin, it convicts us. So that's why I believe the Holy Spirit, again, the Bible says, dwells within us. And we are a temple of God. And the Holy Spirit doesn't dwell within things made, made by human hands. So the church is Christians. The church is the unity of the Holy Spirit that dwells within those who have accepted Christ as their savior and believing in Christ as your savior and accepting the Holy spirit is, is what, uh, you know, brings us together in that, that church, which, you know, is also Jesus Christ. So again, I believe the church is a spiritual, you know, communion with believers who, uh, have the Holy spirit within them. All right. Uh, pine sap, 
If you would like to respond, you definitely can. Uh, but we, this is going to be like closing statements right here. Okay, so you can definitely respond to that if if you would like. Uh, but definitely get into closing statements. We get into the uh, super chat questions. I'll do a short uh, response and sure. then my closing statement. Totally that will fine. be all solid because I I'm kind of limited to time too. I gotta uh, just finish up a little coding assignment I'm working on. So awesome. I you know, don't want to drag out and I don't want to take too well, much also, of your time. I, I, then. Well, I also want to say too, we're going to be doing a straw poll. I don't like to put, you know, who won that type of stuff on these types of things, but for the sake of the debate, we're going to do one. Um, and just let people, let's, let's see how people are feeling about it. You know, kind of way, you know, who performed better basically. Um, and I, I would like to just get this out here. Also, I am a, a converting Catholics. So I'm converting to Catholicism. Um, going into our CIA, uh, and, uh, so obviously I'm a bit biased, uh, in, in this, but I hope that I've kind of removed that. I hope that I've kind of remained totally neutral. Pine Sap, go ahead, man. Thank you for being here. Absolutely. Um, so in regards to Pope Francis and the vaccine, there's something very important to, to keep in mind. When he said um, that it was a moral duty to get the vaccine, he was speaking in his personal capacity. How do we know this? The CDF, the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, put out a document saying that it was personally up to individual Catholics whether they wanted to receive the vaccination or not. Pope Francis being, you know, because he confirms the decisions, the uh, CDF, he signed off on that document. So even though he personally said, you know, it's a moral duty to get the vaccine and stuff like that, which I'll get into maybe why the Holy Father thinks that. But um, even though he said that, in the actual magisterial statement that we have to assent to, or, or kind of lower level magisterium, but but magisterial nonetheless, that we have to assent to as Catholics, um, we just have to assent to, you know, do you want to get the vaccine or do you not? And, you know, most of us say, you know, are, we don't. Um, but that's uh, up to us if you're a Catholic, right? And that comes officially from the Vatican. Is a Vatican document still on you know, still on the records today. So you don't have to get the vaccine or something. And Pope Francis hasn't contradicted that, even though he, in his personal opinion, did state that he felt it was a moral responsibility. Oh. <laughs> CAC. That's kind of CAC. I think he'll be back. Um, so I also just found out, ladies and gentlemen, I don't know if this has anything to do with it. There is a storm here. Bad storm. I can hear it inside. Uh... We'll bring Pine Sap back back though for uh I'm gonna I'm gonna hang up and uh call him back. Pine Sap, if you're there, let me see. I'm gonna join the call again. Total Pine Sap W, by the way, he just like leaves. <laughs> no closing statement needed. He just dipped out. My work is done here. Yeah, my work is done. I think he said enough. Um, yeah, Massad has really been Massad Satan. It's been hitting us hard this stream, but we've been... Okay, hold up one moment. Can't hear anything he says, or maybe that was old. That's an old message. Okay. Um, he's trying... It looks like he's trying to reconnect. I, this is on his end because uh, stream's fine. Stream's fine. Um, Nate, if you would like to do a closing statement, I know that he was kind of responding, but if you just want to go ahead, do your closing statement, we'll get him back, and we'll get him to do... Uh, his closing statement also, if that works for chat. Yeah, I, uh, no, I, I'm, I'm glad we had this uh, discussion. I'm sure it'd take a lot longer to get into more detail about a lot of the, you know, the arguments between Protestants and Catholics, but I uh, definitely am glad it was, pre it was pretty informative from both sides, I feel like. But uh, yeah, I, I, I still, I still think, you know, salvation is through faith in Christ and that, you know, Jesus is the only way to heaven and all who call upon his name shall have everlasting life. And, you know, Jesus is the name that raised people from the dead. Jesus is the name that people use to heal. Jesus is the name people use at the end of their prayers and his name has all authority. And, uh, I just, I, I believe that it's truly strictly salvation is found in Christ alone in his name. And there's no other name under heaven, which men shall be saved. And uh, the Bible, the Bible is, there's hundreds of verses that, that point to faith and faith and faith. And uh, I, I, I still believe that salvation is through faith in Christ. And obviously. Hey gang, I'm back. 
There he, all right, Pine Sav is back, everybody. Uh, we're letting. Sorry uh, about that. My, my internet like went out at literally the worst time, and and it seemed like we were doing so well, but it, it I, I think it just went out all of a sudden on me. So let me see if I can reconnect. But if not, I can just go off my phone here. Okay, that's fine. You just want to call me back. I'm letting just Nate Darnell do his closing statement, and then we'll get into yours. Oh. Go ahead. Didn't mean to interrupt. All right. No, no, you're fine. You're fine. All right. Go ahead. Uh, go ahead, Nate. Yeah. So, um, you know, obviously I believe it's through faith alone, but that's not to say that you don't have, you know, good deeds to back it up. You don't have fruit to back it up. You know, faith comes with hearing. And if you truly have faith in Christ and you truly love Christ and you will do good deeds, you know, you will live fruitfully. You'll have fruits to show that you're a Christian. You'll have, you know, the Holy Spirit that dwells within you that, that will again, show your fruits. So I'm not saying you just sit here and you have faith in Christ and that's it. You know, you you don't just have faith and that's it. You don't just say, I'm a Christian. I believe Jesus is real and you're saved. So I hope nobody thinks I believe that. But I'm saying there's no other outside work because Jesus Christ already did the work for us. He already took the punishment of sin. He already took the punishment of fulfilling the law and he took it upon himself on the cross. So now all he he asks us to do is have faith in him. And again, if you read Galatians 3 about Abraham, it makes it very clear that he, that having faith in Christ is the only righteous act because, again, in Isaiah, it says our righteousness is as filthy rags. So we can do whatever righteous things we want. We can work to make God, you know, love us more or forgive us for our sins. But, you know, faith in Christ is the only righteous thing. And, uh, Again, I just believe it's through faith alone, and and uh, yeah. All right, uh, Pine Sav, your closing statement, then we'll drop the straw poll and get into the super chats. Gotcha. Um, so I'll just go off my phone. That's so uh, when we think of what Christ instituted for the sake of our salvation, we do understand that we are saved through faith alone. And um, I think what I have noticed this entire debate is that there's a misconception about what that term means, right? As Catholics, we do believe that you're... Okay. We have to um, uh, interact with the graces that Christ bestowed upon us, right? So uh, receiving of his body and blood, which we know that we must uh, receive in order to have life in us. Um, being uh, uh, Having him forgive us through uh, one of his... Uh, holy ministers that he instituted when he breathed upon the apostles, uh, being a part of his one holy Catholic and apostolic church that he formed for the sake of all men's salvation. We know that all these things he deigned so that we may have eternal life. And so when, when it is said that we have faith in Christ, we must have, uh, we must belong and have as our mother the church that he instituted for the sake of our salvation, his bride. As uh, the book of Ephesians says, right? So, or letter to the Ephesians. So with all that in mind, we must know that in order to be a part of Christ's flock, we need to be a part of his one holy Catholic and apostolic church, outside of which, unfortunately, there is no salvation. But that being said, it is so incumbent upon Catholics to reach out with hands of love, open to our separated brethren, um, that they might be truly our brothers in christ in the catholic church and that's my closing statement amen brother thank you uh once again all right so i just put out the the straw poll here the straw poll results uh we'll give them a little bit of time to 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 you know put their put their votes and we'll get into the super chats now everybody should be able to hear them so there should be no problems there I'm going to go ahead and turn them on for both screens. You know, that's what you have to do when you're using multiple over here. And uh, we'll get into those. As of right now. Hang Spexo on, sent $3. Why does Nate think it's okay to discredit statues of Mary and Christ? Okay, hang on a Asian second. Asian Ray sent $5 in Luke 148. Mary says that all generations. So first, we'll, we'll get into the Spexo one right there. Uh, why does Nate think it's okay uh, to... What was the first part of that question? Desecrate. Desecrate. What, uh, Mary, I believe, the Holy Mother. Um, go ahead, Nate. Uh, yeah, so... Obviously, I don't believe that Mary is uh, in any sense... Sorry George Phillips that. sent $5, Nate. 
How could Jesus be wrong in Matthew 16, 18 when he said that the gates of hell would not prevail against the church? Okay, we'll get into that one uh, after this, but go ahead, Nate. No, Sorry. but uh, the, the post I made about, you know, the, the statue being vandalized, obviously I disagree with it, you know, people vandalizing it um, because it's it's a biblical figure, but I, I personally I wouldn't vandalize a, a statue like that. I'm just, the whole point of the, the post was that it's an idol because I do believe that worshiping anything but Christ and God the Father is idolatry. So, uh, you know, obviously I, I disagree with the Catholic stance that she is the Holy Mother of God. I believe that she is the mother of Jesus' flesh and that uh, she, was, she was not sinless and that she needed a Savior, as she said in Luke, when she prayed to God and said, My Savior. Uh, yeah, I don't think it's okay to... to vandalize churches and you know obviously when i think it was pro-life uh or roe v wade when churches were being attacked obviously you know i would fight with the catholics to defend the churches but i'm not going to worship uh graven images of any saint or or mary or anything so yeah all right, uh, Pine Sap, I'm sure you have a, a response for that. He just, uh, his camera, oh, just reconnected on his computer. There we go. Pine Sap, I'm sure yeah, you have a response just, for that. I just managed to reconnect. I turned it on and off. Awesome. So, um, yeah, in regards to Mary, you know, it was very interesting that Nate said there uh, and, and referred to Mary saying, you know, uh, you know, praying to our Savior, right? Well, what's very telling about that is I think that's a misunderstanding of what Catholics believe. We don't believe that Mary is somehow like a goddess or, or something like that. In fact, one of the earliest heresies actually in the life of the church that was condemned were people that worshipped uh, Mary as a female deity, right? Because that wasn't the proper respect uh, due to the Holy Mother of God. Um, we understand that Mary be, having that special relationship with Jesus points to ultimately... Um, ultimately to Jesus in terms of, of the prayers that she offers up for our sake, right? So when I ask Mary to pray for me, it's like I'm asking Nate to pray for me or, or, or someone else. However, because of her special uh, role in literally being the, the Ark of the New, New Covenant, you know, uh, bearer of God, the Holy Theotokos, um, she has a special place in heaven next to her son in which when we ask for her intercession, she speaks to her son on our behalf in order that he may bless us, right? It's not her blessing us, but rather her praying on, uh, praying for us to her son, right? And what's very interesting is uh, when, when we hear in the Gospels that all generations will call Mary bl uh, blessed, right? And even Jesus uh, says on the cross, you know, when he's, he's looking at, at um, I, I believe it's John, and he says, you know, uh, mother, look at your son. Son, look at your mother, right? There's a special uh, understanding uh, of the uh, role that Mary holds, right? Furthermore, um, unfortunately, what Nate has professed uh, in relation to uh, Mary is actually uh, Nestorianism. So it's actually uh, 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 from the heretic Nestorius uh, around the fourth, uh, I, be I believe the fourth century at the Council of Ephesus, who believed that uh, Mary did not uh, bear all of Jesus, right? She just bore Jesus's flesh. And so thus, by saying that, that creates a division uh, between Christ's human nature and his divine nature. Whereas we know that his human nature and his divine nature, uh, while, dis while distinct, are in union, uh, in hypostatic union in one divine person, and that and that is the person of Jesus Christ. All right, our next, which I'm going to read these, so I don't get, you know, I have to change them on every screen here. I think that's just simpler. Uh, from Xander, he says, uh, Nate, is it a sin when you falsely misrepresent Catholic doctrine, uh, like when you said, quote, Catholics claim to be saved through works, which is not Catholic doctrine? Um. I mean, we kind of just discussed all of that, how you do need works for salvation. You know, you have to partake in sacraments, and I believe that is a work. So I, I believe that if you do anything besides have, to have faith in Christ and you result to works of your hands or works of your flesh, then, that, then that, that's a work. So you know, if, you, if you go, if you believe in anything besides Jesus, 
you know, because Catholics say, oh, you have to have faith in Jesus and you have to have faith in Jesus and do this, do that. And I believe that's just uh, false. So I believe that it is a work and sacraments are works, just like, you know, baptism is a work or the Eucharist is a work as we just discussed. So, yeah. All right. Well, God, keep going here. The, you've got a lot of super chats, so we're going to try to push through them. If, so, if something's directed to you, um, we'll definitely, or if something I feel like requires a response that we didn't.